paper would you be mine? Could you be mine? It's a neighborly day in this beauty wood. Neighborly day for a beauty wood. You be mine. Could you be mine? I have always wanted to live in a neighborhood with you. I've always wanted to have a neighbor just like you. So let's make the most of this beautiful day. While we're together, we might as well say, Could you be mine? Could you be mine? Won't you be my neighbor? Won't you please? Won't you please? Please, won't you be my neighbor? Good morning, neighbor. I'm so glad to be with you, my lovely neighbors, in this lovely beauty wood. Yesterday, this place was just teeming with love and grace and excitement. Thanks to Jen Seaman and Mary Van Dyke and Denny Brousseau, we collected so many clothes for people who are going on job interviews but don't have the money to have professional outfits. Thanks to all of you who stopped by and brought so many clothes for men and women for all seasons. These pews are filled with clothes and I can't wait till these pews are filled with you. It's a um, great, great, great joy to be together. Um, we, uh, it is homecoming Sunday. And um, I am uh, excited about being at home here with all of you guys. And if uh, one other thing I would say about yesterday is that it was such a joy and such a delight to see people drive up and oh, how much we wanted to hug. Um, but there were so many of you and it was so great and it was great to see people even from a safe distance and uh, thanks again. Uh, this was Jen's uh, vision and it was the whole day was, was another affirmation of when you, when you give, you get so much. Um, this is uh, the neighborhood, welcome to the neighborhood. And I wanna say welcome to all of our neighbors, whether you have been here for 40 years or whether you've been here for five minutes. Uh, this is your home. That's one of the beautiful things about what this place is and what it means is that it is your home the moment you walk into it. So with that, I would just like to ask if there's anybody who is um, visiting for the first time or anybody who hasn't been here for a while and would like to say hello, I would just invite you to... Uh, Unmute yourself and say hi. I can't see if you're waving your hand or anything. So if anyone here wants to say hello, just unmute yourself and, and go ahead. Paul, I just want to say that this is the uh, 10th anniversary today of my mother's passing, Louise Murren, and many of those of you on the screen knew her and loved her as well. We always uh, put a portrait of her up and, and light a candle. So thinking about her today. Thank you, thank you, Jill. Um, I, I wish I had known her and could just say thank you, Louise. Um, you did an awesome job with Jill. Anyone else wanna say hi? Um, okay, well then let's pass a sign of peace, the peace that brings us into um, that understanding of, of being in the, the family of God. So however you want to do it, but I'll say may the peace of God be with you. So, um, hey, there's a knock. That must be neighbor Denny. I know I was expecting her. 
I have to get my glasses. Is that neighbor oh, Denny? There we go. Yes. Hi, everybody. Well, hi, Denny. I'm so glad you dropped by. Thank you. Happy homecoming Sunday. Thank you. And a happy homecoming to you, too. You did. Uh, you guys did a great job yesterday. Thank you. Yeah, we did. It was a lot of fun. Jen had a great vision, and we were happy to help her carry it out. Yeah, and I, I think over 20 people donated, and there's just uh, scores and lots of, lots of clothes, lots of clothes. Yes. yes. Did you bring well, a call to worship for us? I did. You know, I thought it would be so nice to um, uh, continue to evoke Fred Rogers' spirit. So I have my handy book, The World According to Fred Rogers, and I think I have the perfect um, thing to share for Homecoming Sunday. Thank you. Okay. You don't ever have to do anything sensational for people to love you. When I say it's you I like, I'm talking about that part of you that knows that life is far more than anything that you can ever see, hear, or touch. That deep part of you that allows you to stand for those things without which humankind cannot survive. Love that conquers hate, peace that rises triumphant over war, and justice that proves more powerful than greed. So in all that you do in all of your life, I wish you the strength and the grace to make those choices which will allow you and your neighbor to become the very best of whoever you are. Welcome to worship. Uh, we are going to um, go into a hymn uh, that Jen will be singing, and we just encourage everyone to sing along if the spirit moves you. We'll all be muted, <laughs> but uh, the words will be on the screen if you'd like to sing along. Thanks. <laughs> Neighbor Denny, will you read um, our scripture for this morning? Yes, thank you. Um, the first reading is from Genesis and goes, <clears throat> And the Lord stood beside him and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie I will give to you and your offspring, and your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south, and all the families of the earth shall be blessed in you and your offspring. 
Know that I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob woke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So Jacob rose early in the morning, and he took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up for a pillar and poured oil on the top of it. He called that place Bethel, Bethel, but the name of the city was Luz at the first. Then Jacob made a vow, saying, If God be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God, and this stone, which I have set up for a pillar, shall be God's house, and of all that you give me, I will surely give one-tenth to you. Our second reading is from Corinthians. What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will live in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. This Mm -hmm. is the Lord's word. Amen. Thanks be to God. Denny, thank you. Thank you so much. That was beautiful. And Jen... So great to hear you, um, your voice filling uh, the sanctuary here and the sanctuaries of our hearts and our sanctuaries everywhere we are. Um, Thank you and Ralph for making that happen. Will you please join me in a prayer for illumination? Beloved God, we give thanks. Thanks for life. Thanks for this neighborhood. Thanks for these neighbors, these friends, these sisters and brothers. Some have been in our lives so long they feel knitted into our DNA and others we're just meeting and we can't wait to knit them into our DNA. Thank you, God, for everybody in this world who is doing something to make this a better world, especially those who put themselves in harm's way to protect the rest of us, especially on our hearts today. The firefighters, we pray for all those around us who don't have the luxury of sitting down together and taking a deep breath, who might not have the neighborhood, the community, to come together, to refresh, to dwell in your word, and to enjoy the spirit of love and fellowship amongst us. So in this very precious time, we pray that you soften our hearts and open our minds that your Holy Spirit sweep over us and through the mystery that is you, make the words spoken, the words we need to hear. In your many holy names, we thank you, God. Amen. You know, when my mom hit 90, she became very particular. Or perhaps I just became aware of how particular she could be. Everything in her apartment had to be just so. If you moved something, it had to be put back with the precision of military-grade GPS. Oh, oh, honey, turn that just a little bit to the left. No, 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 don't move it, turn it. At first, you'd think she was super picky or peculiarly exacting. But when you step out of your own perspective and viewpoint and experience and understanding and out of my young, healthy body, and when I put myself into her experience, then it all made sense. In the very last years, her mobility was becoming increasingly limited. Her hearing and her, and her vision weren't 100% anymore, as she would say. And she needed to know 
where everything was because she depended on other people to get things for her, to be her hands and feet. And so in order to direct people to the things she could no longer get for herself, she needed to know where they were. You know, at least once or twice in my life, I admit after the company has left, I've given a quarter turn to something on the mantle that my dear guest was admiring and returned just 15 degrees off from its treasured position. Or I've fixed, you know, I've taken a pillow and fixed it just so. I wouldn't say anything to my guests, lest they think I was peculiarly exacting. Of course, these little obsessions are probably more common in the 21st century. In rich nations like the United States, where many of us just have, as George Carlin would say, lots of stuff. Certainly houses were less cl cluttered 3,500 years ago. I mean, Jacob builds a house of God with just a stone he set up for a pillar, a stone that the night before was a pillow. This moment is the first mention of the house of God in the Judeo-Christian tradition. Ruminating on this moment, I wondered about the first mention of my own house. When in my young life did I first realize I was home? I can't remember. I want to say the first time I realized, hey, I'm in my home, this is home, was when it was first broken. It really is true. Sometimes we don't know what we've got until it's gone. But then thinking about this, I thought, no, it was probably much earlier, like the first time I was outside playing somewhere or in kindergarten, or the first time I was just someplace else and something bad happened. No doubt I would have wanted to run home, and I probably did. I definitely remember running home sometimes, running, and oh, the relief, getting inside that door and shutting it tight behind me. For me, there was a safety when I came through that door. Of course, that's not true for all of us. Some of us found home a pretty complicated atmosphere. The reality is that some of us grew up in homes we hoped and prayed we'd never have to return to. Not so for Jacob. He's hoping to go home again. He even makes a deal with God. If God will be with me and keep me in this way that I go, travel with him, and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone, which I've set up for a pillar, shall be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will surely give you, give one-tenth to you. Of course, churches love that one-tenth of the church part. Now, many, many, many years later, Jacob's descendants, the Jewish people, will escape hundreds of years of brutal slavery in Egypt by crossing the Red Sea. And they will spend the next 40 years roaming in the wilderness. And God will tell Moses to make a sanctuary so that I may dwell among you. And they do this, and God dwells among them in the tabernacle for 40 years. And they keep moving. They have to pack it up and reset it up constantly. But wherever they go, God is with them in God's house. Now, when God gives these instructions for the, for the tabernacle, he, um, he's going for an upgrade. The blueprint for the sanctuary, the house of God, is particularly exacting, peculiarly exacting. I mean, the story of the creation of the whole heavens and the earth and all that is within them is told to us in little more than a chapter and a half. But the very specific requirements for building the tabernacle and everything that would go into it and exactly what everything would be made of, that takes like 12 chapters or so in Exodus. Perhaps that stone pillar Jacob anointed so long ago with oil was just not doing it anymore. I know that in 2020, we bring so many things into our homes. We stuff them. Some things are practical, some decorative, some are both. And maybe many of us would need 12 chapters to explain what we wanted and where it should go and what it should be made of because home is important. Good, bad, or indifferent. 
Some of us can't wait to leave it, and some of us spend a lifetime trying to get back to it. But it's important. I'm going to venture that never before have so many people spent so much time in their homes as these past several months. We say home is where the heart is, but nowadays home is where everything is and everybody and anything that's happening is at home. And just when we thought we were going bonkers spending so much time in our homes and just when we couldn't, couldn't, couldn't wait any longer to get out of our homes, we are reminded by the smoky air of the incredible fragility of shelter, of food, of life itself. As fires wipe out entire towns, we remember how easy it is to take so much for granted. Almost always, when you hear a family being interviewed on the news, a family that's just lost every single thing that they own, they've been wiped out, when it's all gone up in flames, what do they say? What does the family whose house has been hurled through the sky and smashed in a tornado say? What does the family who has, been, uh, who has seen their house ripped from its foundations and washed down a heretofore non-existent river, what's the first thing everyone says? At least we're alive. At least we have each other. At least we have each other. There was a story some of you may recall about some missionaries in a, in a distant foreign country and um, a couple when they had three children and uh, the government was very unstable and there was a military crisis and the um, people came and said, you have to leave now. You have one hour to pack. You can take, you know, like 900 kilos or whatever, 900 pounds, whatever of stuff. And so they quickly are looking around their house. They'd been living in this country for years and they're trying to think, oh, I, you know, I have grandma's whatever and, and great grandpa's this. And well, we're going to need that. And they're packing up and they're trying to weigh it and they get it all in a pile and into some suitcases and a, and a, and a trunk. And, and in an hour, they come back to be picked up. And the guards say, as they stand there with, their, with their, all their luggage and their three children, and they say, is this 900 pounds? And they said, yes. And they say, did you count the children? Well, Nothing in any suitcase matters anymore. At least we have each other. Having each other was core in Mr. Rogers' mind. He didn't need to lose it or fear losing it to know that the most important thing was to have each other. I don't know about you, but when I was a kid growing up, I heard a lot about the land of make-believe and even the world of make-believe. But Mr. Rogers created the neighborhood of make-believe. And we all met in Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. There was even a character named Neighbor Aber, played by Chuck Aber. Mr. Rogers was preaching neighborhood. He didn't show us what a neighborhood was. He showed us who a neighborhood was. He didn't try to locate us in the world by where we lived, but by how we lived and with whom. Who are our neighbors? And we lived neighborly. By making the world, both the real world, with Mr. Rogers and the make-believe world of, of King Friday the 13th and Henrietta Pussycat, by making both the real and the make-believe a neighborhood, he, we were all christened as neighbors. And of course, it is neighbors that Jesus puts at the center of our faithful experience. In Matthew, teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? You all know this. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments 
depend all the law and the prophets. That's a really big statement. He's saying everything you read in the Bible must be filtered through these two commandments, to love God and to love our neighbor. And of course, in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus famously answers the question put to him, who is my neighbor, by basically saying, everybody. Mr. Rogers reminds us constantly that we are neighbors, each of us, at the very, very core of God's love and concern. Do you remember last week we read from Isaiah where God says to us, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned and the flame shall not consume you because you are precious in my sight and honored and I love you. It's this focus on the neighborhood and the neighbor that might most reflect a Presbyterian theology in Mr. Rogers. Mr. Rogers was a Presbyterian minister. The Presbyterian constitution says a Christian's personal response to God is in community, the neighborhood. The idea that we are all neighbors and that binds us in a most positive and fulfilling way is also reflected in Jacob's waking revelation. Surely the Lord is in this place and I did not know it. How many of us lose track of God's presence? How many of us don't even have God anywhere near in our thoughts, let alone opening ourselves to that divine presence? The reality is that presence is everywhere at home and in the woods. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place, in this beautiful place and in the places you are now. And in each and every face, when Mr. Rogers says, I like you just the way you are, he's not just reassuring us that he likes us, he's affirming that you, yes, you specifically were created in God's image. How can we complain about being hand-knit by God and gifted to the world of humanity as a unique and precious creature, even when we are one in seven plus billion. I don't know about you, but I have a little list. Some days it's a long list of the things that I don't like about myself. I wish my feet had arches. I wish my high eyes had whatever the good parts that eyes need. I like you just, just the way you are. He's affirming for us and reminding himself that God loved us before anyone else ever did. And that love is permanent and unchanging and unshakable. In life and in death and in all our brokenness, whatever it may be, God loves us just the way we are. Mr. Rogers was pilliered by the conservative media who scolded and mocked his reputation on national television in the days following his death, saying that he created a generation of slackers by telling children he loved them, by telling them they were special when they did nothing to earn it. And this is the awesome grace of God, that we don't earn God's love. God loves us. God's love for us is independent and not at all reliant on who we are and what we do. And when we really, really understand that, when that hits us, when it hits our, our heart, our soul, and our mind, it is a tectonic shift in how we see ourselves in the world. I love Mr. Rogers. I know Denny does too, and probably many of you. He was a deeply spiritual minister who never made your faith a condition of his respect, friendship, and love. In fact, most people in his lifetime didn't know he was a minister. I'd like to close today's message with some words from Fred Rogers himself. These are, in fact, 
the last words he spoke on television. Mr. Rogers passed away after a quick bout with stomach cancer. Mr. Rogers went home on February 27th, 2003. Let's listen. You know, it happens so often. I walk down the street and someone 20 or 30 or 40 years old will come up to me and say, you are Mr. Rogers, aren't you? And then they tell me about growing up with the neighborhood and how they're passing on to the children they know what they found to be important in our television work. Like expressing their feelings through music and art and dance and sports and drama and computers and writing and, and invariably we end our little time together with a hug. I'm just so proud of all of you who have grown up with us and I know how tough it is some days to look with hope and confidence on the months and years ahead. But I would like to tell you what I often told you when you were much younger. I like you just the way you are. And what's more, I'm so grateful to you for helping the children in your life to know that you'll do everything you can to keep them safe and to help them express their feelings in ways that will bring healing in many different neighborhoods. It's such a good feeling to know that we're lifelong friends. We are going to uh, celebrate com communion, and I'm so glad to have our beloved um, Reverend Keenan Kelsey with us today. Um, this would be a good time to gather your elements and um, if you have any prayer requests, I'd like to ask you to put them into the chat box or send them directly to Allison, Allison Deal. And there will come a time when Keenan will call open space for Allison to summarize the prayers that have been collected. So as we listen to the anthem, if you want to enter your, your prayers, um, either to the, to the whole chat room or to Allison, let us prepare.
Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can feel his mighty power and his grace. I can hear the rush of angels wings. I seek presence of the Lord is in this place as I look out here at you there and I see you here and I feel Robin and the choir singing and Ralph at the piano and we are here and we are here in the presence of God and we have this joyful feast of the living God this table knows no human bounds it's owned by no mortal soul or religious denomination. This is the table God sets before us to come and see, to taste, to bring ourselves fully in the presence of the living God with all those saints here on earth and above. We come here with our hearts open, with our souls laid bare, with our arms around each other, we come to this table, come to this table. May the God of gathering, God of belonging, the God of living together be with you. Weary wanderers, offer your hearts to God. Whoever takes us by the heart and leads us back to faithfulness, do not hesitate, but step forward into joy. We will do so, praising the one who immerses us in hope. It matters not where we are, but who we are and whose we are. Let's pray together. Standing at the edge of chaos, you cried out exalted love, and all creation sprang forth from the goodness of your word, creating in us your image, breathing life and joy into us. You drew us near to you so that we could live in joy with you. But your people chose to wander through the deserts of death, paving over Eden's promise with sins. Like a parent with her children, you encouraged us to change, sending prophets to bring us back, back home. But we would not listen, tying up the burdens of our life and putting them on the backs of those very prophets. Then, then you chose to send Jesus to be the witness to your never-ending love for us and to bring us home, fully home, into your embrace. Jesus Christ, your Son, our teacher, is the one who comes to redeem us, seeing the barren lives we can lead. He came to till the rich soil of your hopes and dreams, God, that it might bear life in us. Watching us stumble along sin's side streets, Jesus regularly takes us by the hand to lead us to your feast. He took the burden of pride off our shoulders, carrying it to the cross and leaving it behind in the tomb and striding forth into the promised land of resurrection. So humbly we come here seeking food and sustenance for our journey. We join the centuries of wanderers and witnesses, 
those who cried out to you in Hebrew times and those who followed your promises embodied in Jesus our Christ. And because we trust you, we come bringing all the people and predicaments that we can think of that need your healing, transforming love. The prayers of the people are prayers for this whole world. So today we particularly pray for our country. We need you, God, as we deal with COVID pandemic, we are sheltering, but too many are still dying. Too many are still hungry. Too many are so isolated. We need you to help us deal with our devastating West Coast wildfires, with hurricanes that travel inland and up coast with unprecedented vigor and frequency, with the bad air with the warming seas and dwindling sea life, with the fear that infuses us all. We need you as we recognize and reform institutional racism with its strenuous divisions and hatreds. Hatreds that have now fueled a surge of anti-Semitism in Marin High School chat rooms and Zooms. Embolden us, God, empower us as we face election threats that include postal slowdown and fear of mail-in ballots and Russian and Chinese agencies using social media to foment unrest and influence elections. Oh God, help us know how to deal with white supremacists and QAnon and other networks of conspiracy and lies President himself has made more than 20,000 lies or misleading conducts during the past 15 months. Yes, God, we pray for the world. We pray for our country. We also pray for one another, for those in our community. So I'm going to ask Allison to now read for us some of the prayers and names that have come from the congregation. There are prayers for a knee replacement, uh, prayers for youth and the future leaders, uh, prayers for the elderly with their loneliness, prayers for thank, uh, thanks for Pastor Paul and SBC, prayers for the people of Oregon, and Portland for safety and better air, air quality. Prayers for all those who have lost so much from the fires. Prayers for the first responders and prayers for Lauren and Jake in their new marriage. Uh, prayers for food scarcity in India and for my family. Uh, prayers for Alice Holmes who is suffering from brain cancer. Thanks for the beautiful choir. Prayers for all our neighbors and friends comfort during difficult times. Prayers for rain with no lightning. Uh, prayers for shelter and safety for all the people and animals who've been displaced by the fires. Safety for those who need to travel during these difficult times and healing for the sick and all those who are suffering. God, you have heard our prayers for the world, our prayers for our country, our prayers for each other. Now hear our own private prayers for ourselves. Hear us in a few moments of silence as we confess our errors and express our needs. Private prayers from the depths of our hearts. Pray please in silence.
Amen. So God, you have heard all our individual and specific prayers. Now hear us as we pray together, as Jesus taught us. Our Father, Father. who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon those gathered here in virtual presence and upon these gifts, these gifts of bread and cup. As your grace fills us and binds us together, turn our parched souls into fountains of hope and action. In the name of Jesus, with humblest and deepest gratitude, we make our prayers. Amen. Amen. On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus gathered with his closest disciples. And it was there on that night, for the first time, he called them friends. And as they sat and they gathered, he took the bread and he blessed it, giving thanks to God. And then he broke it. And he gave it to those gathered. And he said, take, eat. This is my body given for you. At the same meal and in the same way, Jesus took the cup, the wine or juice that had been poured out throughout this meal. But this time, he took the cup and he held it up and gave thanks for it, thus blessing it. And he said to all those gathered, this is my blood poured out for the forgiveness of sins. This cup is sealed in my love. So take and drink, he said. Drink you all of it and remember me. So at this point, I would invite you all to take your bread in one hand, break it if you need be, and your cup in the other hand. The blessings that Paul has pronounced over the bread are right this moment traveling through air and space and blessing the bread you hold. Likewise, the cup as you hold the cup, feel the blessings that I pronounce to travel through space and air and surround and center and enter and sanctify your cup. Then together, let's dip our bread into our cup and partake together the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks God. to God. Let us pray. Beloved God, we give thanks for this moment and for every moment that was, is, and ever will be. We give thanks for you being with us, 
beside us, above us, below us, and all around us. We give thanks for this table, for these gifts of the bread and the cup, and we pray that long after the taste has long left our lips, the love that feeds us and sustains us and calls us to action will be answered by our hands and our feet and our voice. In your many holy names, O oh God, we say thank you and amen. And now we'll take our offering. <laughs> God, we give thanks for all the gifts that you have given to all of us. We give thanks, God, to the awesome responsibility to be good stewards of this neighborhood. And we pray that all that you have given us, we use wisely to reach as many people as we possibly can. And we thank you in all your holy names and say, Amen. I Wanted to say just a couple of announcements. Um, Guess Who's Coming to Happy Hour is back September 25th. That's a Friday at 5 p.m. Please check SPIN. Um, if you're not getting SPIN, our e weekly e-newsletter, please call the office or send us an email. Uh, Adult Ed, a uh, meeting on white fragility, will reconvene a week later than was previously scheduled. That'll be in spin and people will get an email, but that's gonna be the following week as opposed to uh, a week from now. I also just wanted to take a little time to say thanks to Joe Silverman for recording the opening and setting up the sanctuary technology, Diane Jorgensen for bringing art back into our liturgical arts, Ellie Mowry Silverman for being the best PA in the world. Thank you, Ralph Hooper, who has worked months trying to master this technology and to figure out how he can bring our choir into one space virtually. Thank you to Robin Sinclair and Elder Grover Deer and, and Jill and Steve and Natasha and Jennifer and Jennifer with glasses. Thank you for bringing to our worship time your beautiful voices. 
We have missed hearing you, and we can't wait to hear the whole choir together again. We miss you so very much. Thanks to Robin Sinclair for all the many things you do, and to big hug to Ali Oswald, the most super cool, super duper producer of our worship services. Thank you, thank you. And our beloved worship leaders, Denny and Keenan, big heart to you both. You know, I ran across something I, I read, uh, a ser- part of a sermon from a few years ago, and I just want to share it with you. It says, but if this building were suddenly empty and others came along and moved into it, and they had no community among them, this building would be a beautiful work of architecture. It would not be a church. It would not be a family. It would not be our home. But because we do have each other, because we do love and care about each other. And if you aren't feeling it, we want you to feel it. Please let us know. We are a family and this is a church here and all over Marin and all over the US and all over everywhere this reaches because surely the presence of God is in this place. So I would say that we're going to go home soon, but most of us are already home and really, That's true, right? So let me just say, let us go out into the world, into the neighborhood, remembering always to share the love of God, to remember that I like you just the way you are, and to remember that life is short, and we haven't much time to gladden the hearts of those who journey the way with us. So be swift to love and make haste to be kind. And know always that the love of God and the grace of our brother Christ and the sustaining breath of the the Holy Spirit is with us now and forevermore. And wherever you go, may you go in peace and let the people say, Amen. Amen. Now, before we open up the mics and we go to um, breakout rooms, don't go away. Because it just so happened that when we were creating the opening uh, for the service, we had a few leftover bits, and Joey kind of strung them together, and I think you might enjoy them. Okay. Allie, will you run the blooper reel? It's a beautiful day in this neighborhood. I have to start over, sorry. It's a neighborly day. This Let's start over. I blew it. Sorry, we're starting over. Beautiful day for a neighbor, won't you be mine? Could you be mine? I have always wanted to live in a neighbor. I collected a lot of clothes that are resting right now on the pews. I look forward to the day when you are resting on the pews. I'm so glad to have this visit with you here in our neighborhood house. That sounded good. <laughs> the appreciation of the clothing drive, I think, just went on a little bit too long. Too long? What do you mean too long? Like, what too long? Well, it might be that you want to mention the important points, but make it like 20 seconds and not like 45 seconds. Rows and rows of clothes. Over here, plaids and solids and winter and summer. And then behind power suits for the women, whole array of shoes, corporate and the men's shirts, bold shirts, we striped shirts, plaid shirts, ask scarves, fruit shades, earth tones. Won't you be my neighbor? Won't you be? Please won't you be? Please won't you be my neighbor? Oh, that was a good. Okay. Hey. A few.